Great, good afternoon and uh, welcome to Probably, Definitely, Maybe. I'm James McGiven. I currently work for Cisco, but that won't be true in about a week's time, so completely irrelevant. What's most important is this next question. Does life exist in our galaxy, intelligent life? Probably, definitely, maybe? Well, a couple of decades ago, they came up with this idea called the Drake Equation, and uh, basically, lovely long string of things, n is the number of civilizations, r the rate of stars, and blah, blah, blah. Basically, what they figured is that conservatively, the rate of stars is one a year, number of uh, stars that have planets, about half, number of those that have planets capable of life, about one in five, the planets will develop life, let's say 100%, and so on. And basically, they came out with this estimate of the likelihood that intelligent life will exist in our galaxy that we can contact. And it's between 1,000 and 100 million. So what we're going to be talking about today is ways of dealing with uncertainty and how we can overcome this using various techniques. There is a maths warning. I'm not going to go into university level maths, but we are going to talk about maths. What I want is for you to see the stuff, be able to recognize it, but not need to know all the fiddly bits of the equations. What you're going to be interested in is understanding how they work and then taking the finer algorithms and applying them to the stuff you do. We're also going to focus on discrete time stuff, not continuous time, because continuous time means using things like differentiation and integration, which just make the whole explanation that much trickier. So the ideas are the same, the maths is slightly different. So chapter one, Bayesian probability and Bayesian statistics. We're going to start off with a very simple definition, the mean, the average. Given a set of variables, one, two, three, four, five, we add them all up, we divide by the number of variables, and that's the average. We have this lovely sigma notation, which just means the sum of everything from i0 up to n. So, where does this come into play? Well, you've all used Amazon, and you've probably noticed that when Amazon does its listings, it will show them by the number of average stars per item. However, they don't take into account the number of votes per item. So there could be one item that has five stars that's listed above another item that has ten ratings of four stars. Which one of those do you think is going to be a more reliable indicator of what that book or film is like? The answer is the one with the more votes. So how can we overcome this? Well, we can start with this idea of something called a Bayesian ranking or Bayesian averaging. It's a bit of a misnomer because there is no such thing if you read a proper maths book, but you will find this all over the internet. Basically what we're saying is we calculate a new rank, a new average, by adding m extra votes of the average score to every entry. So basically what we're doing is we're just shifting everything closer to the average. Let's have a look what that looks like. So, top of the top, we've got 100 votes of average rating 5. You can see that gets pulled down to 4.3 recurring. The one below, same, 5 stars for every vote, but there's only 70 of them. And it gets pulled even closer towards the average, which is 3.5. And, and as you can see, the same pattern goes on. At the bottom, they're getting pulled up towards the average. And by doing this, what basically you're doing is you're redistributing the, the ratings across a different scale. Just like when you're doing random numbers in Java and it only comes out between a range of 0 and 1, so if you want something other than that, you have to multiply it by, say, 100. Now we have to take a bit of a detour. We're going to start off with describing what an event is. An event is some experiment that has an outcome, and one of those outcomes is the event. And we call all the possible outcomes omega. That's just a set, all the possible outcomes. And we say that, you know, if one of these outcomes happen and it matches an event, well, the event happened, it's that simple. So we could say the event is it's raining, or it's sunny, or the coin was heads or tails. The union of events is like anding 
uh, booleans. So union is the event one happens, and event two happens, and event three happens, and so on. And this weird notation at the end is a bit like the sigma notation I showed you for summing up variables. This is just mathematical notation from taking the union of a lot of events. The intersection is or. This is uh, set theory. So union is when you join two sets in a Venn diagram, and intersection is where you take out the outside bits and leave the inner bit. So, some axioms. Axioms in mathematics are something that we just state as to be true. We don't need to prove them, they, we're just saying we assume this statement is true. And then on top of this, we can build proofs and theories and lemmas and all sorts of wonderful things. But we're starting off simple. So, we'll say the probability of an event happening, P of A, is the probability of A happening. And that probability is always between 0 and 1. One is a certain event that will always happen, and zero is the impossible event, meaning it will never happen. And we say that A and B are disjoint, that means they have no influence on each other, if their intersection is the impossible event, because that means you can never have A and B happening together. If they're disjoint, then we can describe the probability of A and B happening as the probability of A plus the probability of B. And this generalizes. Hence the funny equation below. So, some lemmas. Lemmas are what you can actually prove based on the axioms. We're not going to prove them because those are exercises that are done in every textbook. We're just going to do them. So for an event E, the probability of the complement of the event, which is the same as not the event, is 1 minus the probability of the event. Nice and simple. Similarly, the probability of A minus B is the probability of A minus the intersection bit, because you don't want to count that twice in your Venn diagram. If A is a subset of some other larger event, then the probability of that happening is smaller than the probability of the bigger event. And then finally, we've got this nice little equation that just shows you how to rewrite the probability of A and B happening at the same time. Again, probability of A, probability of B, Subtract the bit in the middle of the Venn diagram. Now we come on to random variables. So a random variable is just some event that takes on a value of an outcome. So what we can now do is we can start saying, well, what is the probability of anything from zero to here happening? You know, how much probability is there from saying getting heads or getting tails? Well, we come to this idea of a probability mass function. So the probability mass function always sums to one. And if we're doing something like a dice, where every outcome has an equal probability, then f of x for any x, which is the number of spots you see, is always going to be one-sixth. One-sixth times six is one. Nice and simple. How does this work out? Well, to get a 2, you can have a 1 and a 1, and that's it. To get a 7, as you can see, there are six ways of getting a 7. You can have a 1 and a 6, a 2 and a 5, and so on. And there's symmetry, because we, don't, we actually distinguish dice 1 from dice 2. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to say, you know, dice 1 has 2 and dice 3 has 5, and then dice 1 has 5 and dice 3 has 2 is a different outcome. So that's why you get this lovely shape of the graph. Another type of distribution we'll come across is a uniform distribution. This is what Java random attempts to produce as an outcome. That is, every value between 0 and 1 has an equal probability of being produced. Another common one is the Bernoulli distribution. This is your heads and tails. This is where you've got two possible outcomes. Probability of one is A, and the probability of the other is a, 1 minus A, or P and 1 minus P, as we've got here. And on a coin, if it's fair, it's 50-50. But there are other things where the outcomes aren't always evenly balanced. Another common one is a binomial distribution. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about what this means, but binomial distributions often come about when you're picking things in combinations. So, You've got a drawer full of socks that are all different colours. 
How many must you pick out to get a pair? That's the type of stuff that uh, binomial distributions are working with, these combinations of objects that you can pick out in different orders. And as you can see, the graph, we've got different, the same graph, uh, but with different probability distributions. It's always this kind of hump shape. And depending on the probability being closer to zero or closer to one, will skew the graph one way or the other. OK, back to some axioms. So given two events, we can define the conditional probability. That is, the probability of having B given that we already know A has happened. So we say that two events are independent if the probability of A and B is the same as the probability of A times the probability of B. So back to our coin. The, the, each coin flip is independent of the last. So the probability of getting heads twice is a half times a half, which is a quarter. And it's that simple. We call the prior distribution what we have at the beginning, so the probability of A. And we call the posterior when we've got some extra information to add to it, so the probability of theta given X. So we already know something, we know a little bit about this uncertain situation. So we have a, a posterior belief, an after belief with this extra information. And we can basically explain it like this, the likelihood times the prior probability times the posterior probability gives you this wonderful little memorable thing so you can remember what order to do it in. Um, it's important to note that if the distribution of the posterior is the same as the prior, we call it a conjugate distribution. And these get really important later on, as you see. For example, um, there's a, a distribution I'll introduce in a moment called the normal distribution, which you've probably come across. The prior of a normal distribution is a Gaussian. So we can use that later on. Bayes' theorem. Bayes' theorem works on this conditional probability idea. Basically what they're saying is we can take this probability of A given B and the probability of B and we can rearrange it so that we can then use it. How can we use it, you wonder? Well, pregnancy tests. Not applicable to a lot of you in this audience, I'm sure, but they're a nice, simple example. So how they work is they detect a chemical in your blood called human con chorion con uh, HCG. Uh, I didn't become a doctor for a reason. Um, there are reasons why you can't always rely on this test. There are sometimes this is present when you're not pregnant, that you can take drugs that cause a false reaction, um, and various causes. Additionally, biology is messy, and for reasons of timing, you might not get a positive result the first time, but you might get it later. So we've got a situation here where the test can say, yes, you're pregnant, but it could be a false positive. Equally, it could say, no, you're not pregnant, but it could be a false negative. Now, typically in these situations, what they try and do is they try and minimize the chance of a false negative, because a false negative in this situation would be bad news to communicate. It's better to err on the side of caution and tell someone they are pregnant so they can go get a proper test at the doctor's than tell them they're not, and then they get a nice surprise six or nine months later. So what we can do is we can draw this up as a little tree diagram here. So we take the test, and it says you're pregnant, and then you have two options, false positive or you're really pregnant. But that's not really that helpful. I mean, you know, probability of pregnant, probability of not pregnant, test is positive given that you're pregnant. You know, what can we do to make this more meaningful? Bring in Bayes' theorem. So probability of being pregnant and having the test positive, being pregnant and having the test not positive. So we're starting to ask the question, given the test is positive, what is the probability that the subject is actually pregnant? Now that last graph, you, like, you look at it and you're like, well, what I'd really like is if those bits on the end were the other way around, so that pregnant was on the end and the test bit was in the middle. Well, using Bayes' theorem, 
we can do just that. We can reverse the order of the, of the tree. So there we go. Test. Test is positive, probability of A, not positive, probability of not A. And then we've got the possibility of being pregnant and the test is positive, and so on. But now, you can see, instead of P of A given B, we've got P of B given A. And because we know these end variables, values, we can just calculate back along the tree and work out all the values along. So it's a really nice way of using information you've got, restructuring it, rechanging it into a different representation, and then getting the answers nice and simple. And this is a trick that mathematicians use a lot. Let's consider another application for this. So given that there are diseases in the world and there's a finite set of symptoms for those diseases, we can say that there's a subset that are always associated with a certain disease. And there are another subset that were never associated with that disease. So given that a patient comes in with a certain set of symptoms, what's the probability they've got disease X or disease Y? For example, Ebola. Very popular question at the moment. You know, I feel sick, I've got a fever, have I got Ebola? No. <laughs> Most common answer. But using trees like this, you can actually give a quantifiable number to someone. You can say, look, no, 99% certain you don't have Ebola because, and you can show them the graph. So now that we've got an idea of how conditional probabilities work, what we actually want to do is, given a certain circumstance, we want to know what the most likely outcome of an experiment is or the expected value of that experiment. And all we simply do is take the probability of that event and sum them all up. That's, that's, it's that simple, you know? That's the event probability of, the expected value of, of x is the sum of the probability of all the events. And we call this the first central moment or the mean of the random variable x. We can then go on to cover what's called the second central moment, which is the variance of x, which is how far the values differ from that mean. The bigger the differ, the bigger the spread of the graph, like the binomial one that you saw earlier. That will spread out really wide. The smaller, the closer the end they are to the mean, you'll have a nice clear spike in the middle. There's a third one as well. The third moment is called skewness, and it does literally measure how far to the left and the right of the graph is. There's a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, and a seventh. But they're all basically just building on the same idea. They're pulling out metadata from the distribution of the probabilities. So we mentioned variance. Variance is how far it differs from the mean. Covariance is how far it differs from another value in the same set. So. Instead of it being the mean, you could choose a random thing and say, you know, y and the variance of x. Um, it doesn't seem like it has a lot of use now, but it has a lot of use when we start trying to estimate the errors when we are talking about some of the algorithms later. Now, I did mention the Gaussian or normal distribution earlier. Um, what we have here is a really weird looking function. You know, I've got one over sigma to the root of two pi times e raised to some exponent. Um, pi, e, just in case you don't know, they are just constants in mathematics. Sigma is what we call the standard deviation. And as you can see, we have the mean, a standard deviation, two standard deviations, three standard deviations, four. And these are a measure of how far away from the mean a certain value is. Now, I don't know if any of you follow uh, some of the stuff coming out of CERN, like the Higgs boson, but they always go, we've now proved this with five sigma accuracy. And everyone goes, five sigma? What's five sigma? Five sigma is basically saying, given that we expect noise from the experiment, but we got a result, how far away from the mean of noise is that result? If it's five sigma away, that means it's 99.99999% not a random value, not noise. It's an actual result that you've detected. 
you've eliminated all the experimental sorts of noise and errors. So that's why they use this five sigma is because they're saying, look, we are so certain now that this is a real result and not just some instrumental error. Um, I'm mentioning the beta distribution now because we're going to talk about it later. Basically, it takes a range between zero and one. It's got two parameters you can twiddle, alpha and beta, and it just makes these weird shapes. Of course, everything under the lines has to add up to one, so that's why it does this kind of weird cup shape or the hump shape, is because it always has to add up to one. Um, coincidentally, the beta distribution is the conjugate prior probability distribution for the Bernoulli distribution and the binomial that we saw earlier. So enough maths for now. You've probably sucked in about as much as you can take in one go. We're going to go back to Amazon. And we had the question, how can we rate products with different numbers of votes? Well, remember we had this nice, simple little calculation for adding stuff back in. There's a rationale behind this. What we're doing is we're going to assume that the people voting, their votes are distributed over a normal curve. So that if a lot of people are voting five, then that's going to be the mean, and the standard deviations will drop you down into four, three, and two as they drop off. So now that we know what the prior distribution is, we know how to work out the conjugate posterior distribution. Given it's a normal, as we've said, the conjugate of a Gaussian posterior is a Gaussian prior, and vice versa. So, what we can do is look at the Wikipedia page. And the Wikipedia page very clearly, nicely tells us that, uh, well, we can just substitute in the values and we come up with this weird equation. So, you should be able to see that tau zero mu zero is the same as cm. So that's our prior mean. We're down at the bottom, we've got the precision, which is how closely, you know, how accurately does the probability distribution actually match the voting distribution. N is the number of votes, and uh, T again, tau is again the precision of votes. So that bottom bit is n plus v. And then tau times the sum of all the votes is r plus v. So this is actually how that simple equation works. That's where it derives from. It's from this lovely combination of the posterior and the prior distributions. Different, similar example, YouTube. You can give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Again, the average rating of the clip is the average number of upvotes minus the average number of downvotes. And it also records the number of views. So, how can we start ranking something which includes views and votes, possibly making it more relevant, like videos that haven't been voted on in a year shouldn't be ranked higher than videos that have been voted on today? Well, we can revise our idea of Bayesian rank. Now, remember I said we were using Bernoulli trials, that's where we've got an up or a down with probability of one minus p for one and p for the other. We can really nicely map that with a, uh, sorry, really nicely map that with a beta distribution, which is what you can see here. Um, the x alpha minus one uh, alpha is always going to be less than one, so that's always going to be positive. Um, and again, the same with the other. So it's always going to be a positive value. And this weird thing at the beginning, this one over b alpha beta. That basically just normalizes it back down to the zero to one range, um, which we need for the probability. But what we can start doing is we can start adding extra information. So we can say, well, let's start with alpha being the upvote bias plus the real number of upvotes. Well, what's the bias? Well, let's take, for example, that someone has already loaded, uploaded several videos. We can add that in as a bias. You know, people rank higher that have already uploaded a lot of videos. Likewise, we could say the downvote bias could be things like, you know, people that had videos taken down due to breaches of TOS. Now, the conjugate prior of a beta function, a uh, Bernoulli function is a beta function. So, what, can we, what we need to do now is we need to map between the probabilities 
and some real number that determines the rank. And we call this the loss function. And the reason why we do is we want to minimize the loss. And the loss is how bad is it to rank something too high than too low? And in this case, we're going to say it's k times worse to rank it too low than it is to rank it. Sorry, k times worse to rank it too high than to rank it too low. And when we try and minimize this expression, we get this weird ix u plus 1, d plus 1. Up is u and d is down for the upvote and downvote counts. So this weird x thing is called the incomplete beta function. You don't need to worry about it. It's available in all the mathematical libraries. You just plug the values in you want and you call the inverse function on it. Don't worry about what it does. So what we do is we have this I, uh, incomplete beta function of the upvotes and the downvotes equals 1 over 1 plus k. We know, say, we're going to make it five times worse to rank things, so we stick k in as five, we've got 1 over 6, and then we just solve the equation, and that gives us x for a particular item, and that's our rank. We just do that for every single item in our catalogue, and we get a complete rank, and that's how YouTube actually does its ranking. But going further, we want to make it more relevant still. So suppose in addition to doing the vote counts, we want to make things decay as they grow older. Just like radioactive atoms have a half-life, and if you start with 100 and it has a half-life of 100 years, after 100 years there will be roughly 50 radioactive atoms. Another 100 years, roughly 25. And we're using the same thing. So literally we've got V is the number of existing votes, uh, T is the time since the last vote, uh, and lambda's this half-life, uh, how long it should wait before it the vote decreases by half. And we just update the votes every iteration. And every time we get a new vote, we just record the timestamp and record the new V dash. And again, we solve this weird equation and we get the rank X. So that's how we can do some really nice ranking based on various beliefs about the voting distributions, about how things should age. And it's a very easy way to build quite a complex ranking system without needing to go into any more complicated mathematics. Take, for instance, the house that Skynet built. Um, it's a smart home, it's all Internet of things -y, uh, it automates your temperature of your house, your bath water, turns your lights on and off. And users can provide feedback to say, yeah, that, that was a good outcome or that was a bad outcome. And it can adjust its internal probability model. So one of the things we might want to do is predict behavior. Now, given the user is leaving the office, what action should the house take? Well, it could be really easy, you know, given that it's a Monday and it's 5.30 and the user's leaving the office, I'll turn the house temperature up to 24 degrees, I'll get the oven ready and stuff like that. You could build in extra information, you know, the idea of work days and holidays. You could add in sensors for the weather, so you could go, oh, it's cold outside, I'll put the heating up, it's hot outside, I'll turn the air conditioning on. The trouble is that we have to encode all of this information into the loss function which means that adding new stuff in, like adding a new sensor in, we have to redesign the loss function from scratch. And that's not something that's easy to do automatically, and it's certainly not something that your home user will be able to do. So we need a better approach, and we will find one. We'll start with Bayesian networks, and we'll also talk about Markov chains. A Bayesian network is a directed acyclic graph, and it's a, just a graphical representation of random variables and their interplay with each other. The vertices are states, so for example, here we've got uh, cancer uh, in the middle, uh, and pollution, smoker at the top, two causes, and uh, at the bottom, x-ray and... Uh, Dyspnea, which is difficulty in breathing. Uh, X-ray means X-ray of your chest, and it's either clear or has some trace signs of some infection. Well, 
we know certain values of this. For example, we know that the probability of someone having high exposure to pollution is only 0.1%. But the average people is three, three people in 10 roughly smoke, so your chance of being a smoker is, you know, 0.3 versus 0.7 for not. In the middle, we've got the probability of having cancer given pollution and smoker. So pollution's low, smoker true, you get this value for the probability of having cancer given these things, and so on. Downwards, we've got you know, the probability of having cancer given the x-ray is positive, or having cancer given that you have difficulty breathing. Now, from these partial bits of information, you can build up an entire probability tree table. We call it the conditional probability table. And you just apply Bayes' theorem over and over again. Now, obviously, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, the number of nodes, you have, vertices you have in the graph. In fact, it's going to be 2 to the power n plus 1, where n is the number of states. So you can quickly see how this gets to be massive and quite unwieldy. Nevertheless, you can do some really cool stuff with it. So, given someone is a smoker, we can reason downwards, do they have cancer? Hmm. Well, let's run the x-ray test. Do they have difficulty breathing? No, x-ray was clear. Probability of cancer? Low. If those two queries turn out positive, they increase the probability of you having cancer. And we call this predictive reasoning, because you're saying, well, you're, you're a smoker, so you're likely to develop cancer. And this lets us work out how likely. Doctors quite often do the opposite. So you come in with some symptom, like difficulty breathing, and they'll go, ooh, what can cause that? Maybe cancer. What can cause cancer? Well, pollution or being a smoker. So they can quickly ask questions like, are you a smoker? And if you say no, then they can instantly go, well, we need to check to make sure you haven't got high levels of pollution. So it's called diagnostic reasoning. And it ha happens in the opposite direction to predictive reasoning. And there's two more that don't actually happen in the other direction. They're kind of a mix. The first is called intercausal reasoning. So given someone has cancer, and they find out they're a smoker, the likelihood of pollution also being involved gets vastly reduced. In fact, you can explain it away. And that's what this intercausal reasoning is also called. It's called explaining away. And you'll find it happen in lots of things, like climate change. Can you explain away climate change by ignoring man-made pollution, for example? The answer is no. But this is how you would go about doing it. Another thing is combined reasoning. So, given someone's a smoker and they've got difficulty breathing, what's the likelihood they've got cancer? So you're taking two outward bits and trying to project into the middle. Um, this is predictive and diagnostic reasoning combined together. And these are the types of things that doctors use a lot. So, we've done quite a bit on probability. We're going to look at Markov models now. Markov models are a stochastic or random process, and it's a collection of variables that represent the state of the system at various points in time. So random variable one at time one, random variable two at time two, and so on. Classic examples of this are things like the stock market, where you just see these lovely spiky graphs, or ECGs for your heart, EKGs for your brain. Um, and we, we group them into four different things. Basically, discrete time or continuous time, discrete space or continuous space. And obviously, that's as intuitive as it sounds. Discrete time is chopped up into chunks. Discrete space is chopped up into a grid. And continuous is nice and flowy. And as before, we're going to ignore the continuous ones because they are the hard ones. And I have to apologize now because we're going to take another brief detour into maths. This one's really quick. I don't expect you to be able to do this stuff. What I'm hoping is that you'll see it, you'll recognize it, and then when you use the Java libraries, you'll just understand what's going on under the hood. So, 
vectors and matrices. Vector is a one by n matrix, and a matrix is obviously m by n. And we've got a lovely one by three column vector here, and then a two, three by two matrix there. Um, if the matrices are the same size, we can add them together. And it really is as simple as just for that element, the first element in the first column in the first row in matrix A, you add to the first element in the first row in the first column in matrix B, and so on and so on. Just really simple adding them up, as you can see by this bottom bit here with the nice uh, little numbers there. A11 is the value of column one, row one, and, and so on. Multiplication is slightly weird because if A is N times N, B must be M times P. So the width of one has to match the height of the other, basically. And we define the multiplication using this weird thing, you know, this big AB11 where you're summing up a row and a column and it's really hard to describe. So the easiest way was some pictures. We've got two two by two matrices here. And to get the first one, we multiply the first row and add it to the second column. So you get A11, B11, plus A12, B21. Some kind of like across and down. And we do the same for the next one. We go across and we go down. And then we go across and we go down. And we go across and we go down. So it's like a little seven every time. Um, and that's how you multiply matrices together. Now, just like in numbers, where if you multiply 10 by 1, you get 10, there's an identity matrix. You multiply any matrix by the identity matrix, and you get the, the matrix back again. And it's just this really simple thing. It's just diagonal of 1s, with everything else being 0. Now, we've got 3 in the real numbers, and if we multiply 3 by a third, we get 1. And the same goes for matrices. If you take a matrix and multiply it by its inverse, you get the identity. Now, to show you how you work this out, we've written out the equations again at the bottom. And you'll see you've got four equations with eight unknowns, which means you've got enough information to solve this system. You can work out what all the values for A11, and B11, A21, and so on are. And just do a bit of computation, hard work, and out the values drop. Or you just plug it into a nice library, and out the answers drop. OK, last bit of matrices. The idea of a transposition. Basically, a transposition, we take everything and mirror it down this diagonal line. So the B and the D swap places, but the A stays the same. If it was bigger, then again, again, you'd have A, C, G, and everything else on the other side would be mirrored across that line. So, end of that detour, and I promise that's the last detour into pure maths you'll have. So, again, a Markov chain is a directed graph whose vertices represent the state and the edges represent the probability of moving from one state to the other. Frequently, we use something called an adjacency matrix, which is if you draw a table and you label, so A, B, C, A, B, C, if A has a link to C, you'll have a value in the table there. And if C has a link to A, you'll have a value in that column there. I'll show you a graph in a minute, uh, matrix in a minute with a graph, and it'll make a lot more clear. So for a chain with n states, you can have an n by n matrix. We start with an initial state, S0, and all we do is at every step, we just multiply this current state by this transition matrix. So at the state Sn plus 1, the value is equal to the initial vector times the transition matrix to the power n plus 1. It's that simple. So here's an example to uh, add a bit of context. British weather, as sure if any of you have been, we never have two nice days in a row in England. In fact, the chances are if we have a nice day, 50% the next day will be rain, 50% the next day will be snow. On a bad day, 
half the time it changes to another bad thing, or stays the same, and a quarter, a quarter of the time it will change back to being nice. So you can see in this matrix here, nice and nice has zero because it will never go from nice to nice. But nice to rain and nice to snow have a half. And snow to rain is a quarter and rain to snow is a quarter. And as, as you see, the whole thing, will, each column will add up to uh, one across and one across and one across again. So the rows always add up to one. Let's have a look what this graph looks like. So we've got a nice little loop on nice, which is zero probability of going to itself. Half on the edges and half on the snow. And yeah, basically th this is what the, the graph of that transition matrix looks like. Now we can define a special type of Markov chain called an absorbing Markov chain, which basically means that there are some states where once you get there, you never leave. And what we can prove is that, provided a chain is an absorbing chain, it will always end in one of those states eventually. Let it run forever, and eventually you will end up stuck in one of those states. And the classic example of this is the wandering drunk. Um, this will be familiar to some people of you who have been to DevOps in several years and seen one of my colleagues as the wandering drunk. And he will always get stuck either between here or the hotel. And he will just wan random wan wander randomly until he gets to one place or the other. It's really inconvenient when you're trying to get up to meet up with him here. But what we can start doing is we can start asking some questions about these Markov chains. We can say, how long until we expect to reach this, one of these fixed states? Or how many times does the tramp or your friend stop at a crossroads and decide which way to go? And how many times does he end up coming back to the same place? Those are the types of questions that we can start asking. And Markov models like this are found in cash flow management for companies, uh, predicting how gambling, uh, pe people who are gambling will bet. Um, and to a certain degree, stock markets, apart from they generally don't tend to have uh, an absorbing state apart from bankrupt. Another type of Markov chain is what they call a Goddick. Um, yeah, a regular Markov chain is one where you take the transition matrix and you times it by itself and you times it by itself and you times it by itself, and eventually you'll find that all the values in that matrix are always positive, i.e. non-zero. Um, and a Goddick chain is one where, given that graph, it's possible to get from any one of the states to another. Maybe not directly, maybe via another state, but every state is reachable. Um, so what we can say is that every regular chain is agodic, obviously, but not every agodic chain is regular. But what we can show is that, given enough time, these chains will evolve to a steady state they'll converge on some constant sort of probability states. And we can start answering similar questions. How long on average is spent in each state? How long till we reach this point of stability of equivalent? How long on average before we reach a state for the first time? Or if we start in state A, how long till we get back there? Um, these were put into use in queuing theory. Queuing theory was started about 1909-ish, uh, group up by um, a guy called Erlang. Uh, worked on telephone exchanges, there's a language named after him. And he came up with this idea, you know, A is the uh, arrival time of jobs in the queue, size of the jobs is S, and C is the number of servers uh, responding to those jobs. And basically this is modelled using a Markov chain. And from this, we can derive Little's law, which is that the mean throughput is the mean number in the system divided by the mean response time. Which is remarkable because it's not influenced at all by the rate at which new jobs arrive or the distribution of that arrival. So the service distribution, the service order, everything like that makes no difference. All that really matters for throughput comes out from this lovely Markov chain calculation that just says, you know, mean number in divided by mean response time is mean throughput. 
So, we've seen Markov chains. And we saw earlier when we talked about the Skynet house that we wanted to start saying, you know, given that the user's in the office, what's the probability that they're about to transition into the state of home? And given that they're in the state of home, what's the... Um, I can take some actions like turning the heating on or turning the aircon on. How can I work out what action is best? Well, this is where Markov decision processes come in. So, a Markov decision process extends the idea of the chain. The difference is that uh, in addition to having the states, at each state you've got a possible set of actions and a function that determines the likely reward of doing that action. So say that it's a hot day, turning on the heating is going to be a very low reward. Turning on the air con is going to be a high reward. And you eventually end up with this uh, sort of equation that basically says, you know, this is the function that you're trying to minimize. This uh, LT, where LT is the discount factor, um, the difference between future report rewards further down the line and the rewards that you can get right now. Um, RA is the rewards available at your current step. Uh, P is the transition into the next steps. And A is the actions available. So we end up with this system here. Um, you can solve it by linear programming, which is uh, using matrices and cool stuff like that. That's called a simplex method. Again, available in virtually every maths library, so you just plug your values into your matrices and go simplex solve and it will do it for you. Or you can use dynamic programming like MapReduce. So what you can do is you can take each state, split it off, run it, and it calculate it in its own little server, send the result back and work out from the results that are sent back from each one of those calculations which one has the highest value and that's the action you take. A similar situation to this is where instead of knowing exactly what state you're in now, there's also uncertainty about the state you're in. Now this crops up, for example, when you've got robotic cars, for example, on Mars, the rover. It has a fairly rough idea of where it is in terms of GPS, uh, inertial navigation, you know, dead reckoning, things like that. But there's still some uncertainty, and we call this a partially observable Markov decision process. And the ideas and how you go about solving are exactly the same, apart from you've got this extra added bit of uncertainty to deal with. So it just makes the calculations a little bit more complex. That's the end of Markov chains. If you want to hit, know some more about Markov chains, you have to go and speak to the Eclipse guys uh, down on the stand. They've been doing some really cool stuff with Markov chains and predicting uh, what the autocomplete should be. Um, so if you want a, a good concrete example um, and how it's working, you can go and pick their brains. But the last part of this talk is on what we call Kalman filters. And they work on these linear dynamic systems, which basically say that given the state at one point in time, we can calculate the state at the next point in time just by multiplying it by some matrix or some constant value or something like that. Uh, the one that you've got at the top is a differential equation and the discrete version, which is uh, equivalent uh, below it. And the reason why we call them linear systems is that given any two solutions to these systems, a combination of them, like one times solution A plus two times solution B, is also a solution to these systems. So let's get concrete with an example. We've got our smart home temperature centers that contain noise. The heating and AC can be either on or off, and they just have a constant rate of heating or cooling. And there are similar systems for humidity as well. So what we have, if we've got a state X, which is the current temperature, say. And A is the transform of the current state to get the next one. So, for example, if the heating's on, all we'll do is we'll multiply the current temperature by 1 point, say, 1 for a 1% rise. Um, the next bit is U, is the, the measurement, the external measurement that you can take. So, for a, say, for example, from a temperature sensor or from a camera. 
Now, sometimes these aren't ready to be completely fused with the internal model. So you have this matrix B, which transforms it into the internal model so you can combine them. And finally, you've got this random bit of noise on the end. Now, note that this is a linear system, so any one solution can be added to another solution to produce a third solution, which makes things nice and neat. Um, the noise, incidentally, is Gaussian, uh, which we've discussed before, the normal distribution. Um, and it's got the same dimensions as the, the state vector. Now, these Kalman filters, they came about sort of in the, the early 1960s by um, Kalman, uh, a Hungarian, whose ideas were so radical that they actually refused to publish them in any maths or computer science or control systems journals. And he started publishing them in mechanical engineering journals to begin with. However, they were used in NASA's Apollo navigation computer uh, in 1961, uh, and they are still the core uh, sort of algorithm used by lots of navigation systems. And the reason why is because they are incredibly robust. We're going to look at the discrete time version. Again, there are continuous time versions, but they are very complex. There are also ones for nonlinear systems, which get even more complicated, and we just don't even have time to discuss those. So how they work is they make a prediction of the future, they take a measurement, compare the two, make some adjustment so that the internal model now closely matches the measurement from the outside, and repeat. They're discrete, they're recursive, and as I said, they're extremely accurate if your model of the situation is good. So, here's an overview of how it works. We've got the current estimate is made up of the measured value times this Kalman gain thing, plus the previous estimate times the, the minus of the Kalman gain. Uh, imagine these are just real numbers to begin with. So, as K gets bigger, we're putting more belief that the measurements of the real world are accurate and that our internal model is less accurate. The lower the gain is, the more we're trusting our internal model than the external readings. So how do they work? Well, they're based on a Markov chain with a linear operator perturbed by errors. That just means random noise. Uh, that is Gaussian distribution, so normal. Uh, start with a vector, which represents the state of the system. Uh, usually use real numbers. There are cases where complex numbers come into play, but generally not in the realms of uh, most uh, applications. And we just recurse and calculate and recurse and calculate and recurse. And we break this algorithm down into two phases, predict and update. And there are seven steps in total. Number one, update the prediction of the state. So we take the current previous estimate of the state, update it with this internal transition model, take the inputs from the, the measurements and multiply it by this munging matrix that allows you to fuse the model to the internal model, and that gives us our predicted state. We do a similar thing to get the predict covariance prediction, which is a, a prediction of how different how the variance between the measured and the predicted. Not from the mean, but from each other. So this is the, the covariance we were talking about earlier on. And we can see it's used here to make sure that we're trying to minimize this error prediction. The next step is that we actually then have to come up with the covariance for the next iteration through. Again, we've got this weird observation matrix and the predicted state. Uh, change to the last one, uh, the last predicted state, and we take the measurement vector and we combine them, and that gives us this, this new error prediction. Uh, again, more error prediction. This is the final bit. Then we do the Kalman gain. Uh, so take the covariance, invert it, the tra uh, transpose of the observation matrix, and that's why we introduced the transpose and the covariance uh, that we did in step two, and that gives the Kalman gain. Update the state, nice and simple, you know, times the invariance and the Kalman gain, add it to the previous state, and that gives us our new state estimate. And then the final thing to do is update the error prediction. 
Um, the I is the uh, identity matrix. K is K dot H is always going to be uh, small but positive, so that's going to leave the identity matrix, you know, small but positive, no negatives. Um, and that's it. That's how you'd run the al algorithm. Now, you really don't need to know all those details because most of the libraries have all of that in there. What you need to just do is work out which of the matrices are which, put the right values in, and then let the computer do the calculations. But let's have a look at a quick example. So a voltmeter, it's expecting to measure a constant voltage. So the previous voltage should be the last voltage plus a bit of noise. The state transition, since it's always going to be the same state as the last one, is always going to be 1. Again, since we're taking direct measurements from the sensor that we can fuse to the internal temperature, it's 1. We're not changing anything based on external stuff, so the control matrix is 0. Um, we think that we know this really well, so we're going to say that the estimate of the error in this model is really low, 0.0001. But we don't trust the sensor a lot, so the error in the sensor, the measurement covariance, is going to be 0.1. We can pick any number as the starting value, just to prove how robust this is. And again, the, the initial covariance, we, for various reasons, we can pick very, pretty much any number, 1, just because. So let's sub these in. We can see that we've got, you know, Xn is just Xn again because we're expecting the same voltage as the last time. Subs all these values in, simplify them a bit, and these are the three equations that you then need to work out from your current state to the next state. Uh, you can see that K is always going to be positive and slightly below 1. Um, and then, yeah, that's, that's how you calculate the next state prediction and error prediction. And here's a graph of that voltage being, algorithm being run through. So as you can see here, we started at a voltage of 3, even though we were expecting uh, a voltage of uh, one and a half, sorry, one and a quarter. And the pink line is the Kalman prediction. And you can see it really quickly converges on the blue line, which is the true voltage. And you can see how much of the noise is eliminated from the measured, which is the yellow. This is how good Kalman filters are for filtering out noise. Your challenge is to find the values that are necessary to plug into the matrices. This is not a trivial challenge, and you will need to do a lot of reading about the particular context in which you're trying to model uh, to work out what the correct things are. Um, there's quite a lot of examples out there on the internet for doing things like tracking balls, dropping through the air, where you have to take into account gravity, stuff like that. They had different equations in, which is why I didn't want to introduce them right now. But this is Freezing Eskimo, and this is his really cool robot-controlled helicopter. Uh, it's called an Excel Tempest. Uh, he's got a really large grin, and I probably would if I had a chopper like that. Um, but there's a website uh, called Wiki, uh, the Helicopter Hovering Challenge. And basically, it provides you with a simulator. And you can go along and construct your Kalman filter. And the challenge is to make the helicopter hover for 10 minutes in this Java simulator. And it's a really good way of getting your hands on both filtering input and learning how to use uh, Kalman filters to filter the output to make sure that you've got nice, smooth motor control for your actuators and things like that. So, in summary, we've had events and random variables. We've got conditional probability. We've had Bayesian networks. That's all about the basics of probability, inference and reasoning. From there, we can build on models that con these processes of random variables, Markov chains, random walks, and so on, Markov decision processes. And then finally, we have the idea of using the uncertainty and trying to filter out uncertainty from signals, both input and output signals. And that's what Kalman filters do. 
There are some really good books. Um, this first one uh, is free. Uh, it's really good introduction to probability. Uh, the next one down is really good introduction to the Bayesian stuff. Uh, if you are ever doing stuff with ranking or uh, conditional probability, that's the book I'd recommend. Uh, the stochastic modeling one is great for the Markov chain stuff. It goes into, into real depths, lots of mathematics, but also lots of concrete examples and proofs and exercises. Um, and then finally, um, the artificial intelligence and model approach it's a very light book, but it covers a lot of topics in, in a short amount of detail. So it's a good primer if you're looking for some more information on various topics surrounding these areas. The libraries you can use, uh, Apache Commons Maths has Kalman filters, it has loads of matrix stuff in there. Um, there's Cult, which is the library produced by CERN. It has lots of linear algebra in there, lots of matrix stuff, lots of statistics stuff. Um, there's the parallel cult, which is a wrapper around that, parallelizes it. Um, and then there's JBlast, which is one that I've only started using recently, but basically it's a Java wrapper around the native C libraries. Its performance so far seems really good. However, this last one, this uh, Google Code Java Matrix benchmark, this is a website that gives you a full list of all the Java libraries and does benchmarks against how they perform in various scenarios. And here's a bunch of other online resources. Uh, I'm going to put these slides up uh, in a day or two, so don't worry about scribbling them down, but there's some great stuff on Bayesian, uh, clearer derivations of the Bayesian rank that we discussed. Um, there's some cool stuff on Kalman filters, how they're derived even simply. And then this last one, there's a whole bunch of articles about how Kalman filters apply to robotics, to navigation, to home control, all sorts of stuff. And they've got worked examples as well. So practical examples of how Kalman filters can be used. And we've run out of time. Thank you for bearing with me through so much maths. And I hope you enjoy the rest of DevOps. <laughs>